Céline Dion. My dream to be international star. Could it happen again? Could Céline Dion happen again? I'm Thomas Leblanc, and Céline Understood is a four-part series from CBC Podcasts and CBC News, where I piece together the surprising circumstances that helped manufacture Céline Dion, the pop icon. Céline Understood, available wherever you get your podcasts. Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. For as long as the two nations have existed, Canadians have been comparing their country with the one to the south of us. We don't usually come out ahead, but we take pride when we do, and by most standards of developed nations, we're usually fairly close to one another. Except for productivity. For a long time, Canada's productivity could keep pace with, if not match, America's. But something's been happening in Canada for a few years now. It is not a simple problem to solve, but it's pretty simple to explain. Canada's productivity is in the tank, across almost every industry. It is now way behind America as a whole, and even large provinces, like Ontario, are more comparable to states like Alabama in terms of how much they actually produce. So how did this happen? Why did Canada fall so far behind by this metric? And exactly how do we measure productivity anyway? How much of this declining productivity is actually within Canada's control? And what are we doing about the aspects that are? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Trevor Toome is a professor at the University of Calgary's Department of Economics and the Director of Fiscal and Economic Policy at the School of Public Policy. Much of his research recently has detailed Canada's productivity decline. Hey, Trevor. Good morning. How are you? I am doing very well. Thank you for finding some time to chat with us today. My pleasure. Why don't you start by just explaining the basic concept to us. Uh, When we discuss a country or a province's productivity in economic terms, what is that? Because I think people have heard this term a lot without understanding exactly what factors uh, go into it. That's a great place to start. I mean, the word productivity does sound like an abstract economic concept, fairly dry and boring. Right. Uh, but, But it's really just a measure of how much we produce for each hour that we work. For example, how much uh, haircuts, how many cars that we make each year, add it all up and then divide that by how much we're putting into production of goods and services, how many hours that we're working. And ideally, we'd like to produce as much as we can for each hour that we work. That gives us resources to both enjoy as consumers, but deliver public services as well. And it gives us the option to maybe work a little less Mm -hmm. and still enjoy the same overall standard of living. So this measure is quite important because it is the foundation of our overall Uh, standard of living, how much we're able to consume and enjoy and the resources that we need to do all the other things that we value. So we're not just measuring raw output here. What we're measuring is essentially, I guess, how efficient we are at creating uh, that economic output. That's right. I mean, if you are able to produce goods and services in your economy more efficiently, then it's effectively easier to produce, which means you don't have to put in as many hours or each hour that you do work, you get more out of it. And so think of it, yeah, as efficiency or as the overall effectiveness, if you will, of the, the labor that we're all putting in each day. We hear the term crisis a lot attached to various things in Canada right now, but people have heard of our current productivity crisis. Maybe if you could give us a bit of context historically, how has Canada's productivity uh, compared with some of our peer countries? And, you know, what trends have we seen if you go back far enough? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So it's natural for us to look south of the border. Canada-U.S. comparisons are, of course, quite common. They are our largest trading partner. They are the closest country to us. And if we look historically, let's say 50 years ago, a half century ago, Canada was uh, behind the United States, but just a little bit. And we were ahead of Australia, Great Britain, uh, and others, for example, ahead of the overall G7 in terms of the amount of output per hour that we produce. And over the decades following that, Canada and the United States tended to grow at a pretty similar pace in terms of how much that increased. In recent years, especially in the past decade, we've seen a, a big change in that with overall levels of growth in our GDP per hour really lagging behind not just the United States, but many other advanced economies as well. Hmm. Uh, 2024, for example, might be the first year since at least 1970, when we started to gather this data, that Canada will fall behind the overall average of advanced industrial economies. And so our, our peer economies today are Spain and Italy. Mm. That's kind of where Canada is in terms of its overall productivity performance. And the U.S., meanwhile, is uh, this year on track to produce about 50% more per person than Canada does. And that's a bigger gap than we have seen at any point since the Second World War. And, and we have to go back to the days of John A. Macdonald to find a period where the gap was persistently as wide as it is. So there has wow. been some big changes in recent years in terms of Canada's productivity growth. And I think that's why it's getting as much attention as it is. What does a declining rate of productivity tell you about a country? Well, it tells me that living standards will be growing less than they otherwise would. And we do see that in the pace of growth of inflation-adjusted disposable incomes, for example. We, we haven't seen a period where uh, disposable incomes and the purchasing power of those disposable incomes has grown as slowly as it has now since a pretty difficult recession in the early 1990s, what some have referred to as the uh, the Great Canadian Slump was mm. the name that uh, some top economists gave to that 1990s recession. So income growth is uh, pretty disappointing. I think people they may not phrase it as a productivity challenge or the growth of disposable incomes being disappointing, but the affordability challenge, the fact that earnings have not grown as much as we'd like relative to prices, right. that's really in part due to a disappointing productivity growth. Can we pinpoint something that changed uh, that started us on this downward path? Do we have any indicators that can tell us what's behind it? That's a really difficult question. So first, Canada has always lagged behind the United States in terms of its productivity. And part of that is we just have a, some greater fundamental economic challenges to overcome. We're a, a larger country with far fewer people, mm -hmm. population centers separated by vast distances. And so internal uh, exchanges, internal trade is just more costly, more difficult and that's fine. But the gap that's grown in the past decade, you know, there's likely a lot of factors. First, Canada is a small open economy where international trade is a really big part of what we do. You know, roughly one third of our economy is tied to international trade, international exports, a lot of it to the United States. And if we look back a few years, the uncertainty around the trading relationship with the United States when we were renegotiating NAFTA, for example, that, that kind of uncertainty represents a, a big drag on investment and growth in trade-oriented sectors. You know, if, if you're a producer, uh, a larger multinational firm in particular, thinking about expanding or, or setting up a plant in Canada to produce and export you would sensibly pause uh, until a lot of that uncertainty with the U.S. was resolved. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, that uncertainty is, is still with us. We're speaking now prior to the U.S. election outcome. Right. But, you know, whichever candidate wins, the U.S. has taken a more protectionist turn in recent years, and that's a big challenge for a trade-intensive economy like Canada. We've also seen 
uh, a change in government. And, and I certainly don't want to uh, put all this on the feet of the federal government, but we have seen changes in policies in particular around increasing our effort towards meeting greenhouse gas emission and, and climate goals. And, and there's good reasons for that. Mm-hmm. And that would la- naturally, though, lead to potentially less investment in emissions intensive sectors like oil and gas, which are a fairly large contributor to overall investment levels in Canada. And then finally, if I were to turn to provinces, uh, I mentioned internal trade, and some of that's just difficult because of the large distances in Canada, but there's also big policy barriers to trade between provinces in Canada. Rules and regulations, they're just different from one place to the next, and that makes it hard for businesses to scale up and operate across multiple jurisdictions. And that's a drag on on productivity. And in an increasingly uncertain world, that internal market within Canada becomes more important, uh, but faces a lot of challenges. So I'd say there's a lot of contributing factors to this. That is a lot. And and in that answer, uh, you mentioned a couple of different sectors, the oil and gas sector, um, and I guess the international trade sector, if you can call that a sector. Where in particular are we struggling or is this across the board? Can we look at certain sectors like oil and gas and and say, this is the problem and if we could solve this, overall productivity wouldn't look so bad? Or is it sort of a, a blanket challenge we're dealing with? Yeah, there are certainly some sectors that stand out as contributing to some of the uh, disappointing growth in your recent years. So let's start with oil and gas. I mentioned policy changes there, and and all policy has pros and cons, but I think that the biggest challenge in that sector is actually not from policy within Canada. It's uh, world commodity prices. They fell sharply uh, in 2015 and 2016, and that means the value of this good that we're producing for export drops. Mm -hmm. And that means that firms thinking about expanding or setting up new facilities changed their plans. So investment levels fell. Capital accumulation fell. So oil and gas is a big part of the story after 2015, just because of that big price shock. And even with high oil prices in 2022, we are not seeing, and I think sensibly not seeing, a big increase in investment in that sector because the longer term outlook is what's more relevant for them. Another sector that stands out with actually negative growth in productivity in recent years is construction. Hmm. And that's an important sector because, of course, every other sector is going to rely on buildings to some degree or another. And so how uh, efficient we are at building matters. Mm -hmm. But then think about housing and the effect on individuals with housing prices being what they are. If the construction sector didn't experience the negative growth in productivity in recent years, and the really disappointing growth in productivity even in the decades previously, then we might not have that same scale of a housing challenge that we have now. So those are two important sectors, uh, oil and gas and, and construction. Overall, though, it's goods producing sectors that have seen the most disappointing productivity performance relative to services. So manufacturing too, not nearly as bad as construction, but manufacturing productivity growth lags behind services. And so that's, I think if we were to have our attention put anywhere, it would be in the goods producing side of Canada's economy. What I'm trying to suss out here is what we're doing wrong. Because in a number of answers here, you've sort of spoken about, uh, there are factors here beyond our control, right? There is the chaotic nature of international trade, especially with the U.S. right next door. Mm -hmm. Uh, We obviously don't control the global price of oil and gas. And I am assuming, uh, as is usually the case, that the pandemic plays into this a little bit. So I'm trying to differentiate, you know, what are sort of global headwinds that we are caught in? And then uh, what are things that we specifically have made choices uh, not to invest in or ramp up that's costing us productivity now? Yeah, I'd say that while I don't have a, a precise measure of this, my sense is that most of the source of the drag and in, in recent productivity performance is external. Hmm. And it is tied especially 
to the uncertain global environment. And that's naturally going to be a drag on an economy that is as trade intensive as Canada. And there's very little that we can do about that we are sort of at the at the whims of these global developments, in particular uncertainties in the United States. And policymakers in Canada have, I think, recognized the risk of having a, a high degree of reliance on our trade with the United States by pursuing trade liberalization with others. Right. Current government and, and governments before pushed forward on uh, a new free trade agreement with Pacific countries through the Trans-Pacific Partnership and with Europe through CETA. And so it's these kind of policy moves that they're very slow and difficult, but over time they are quite important and helps to shift and diversify Canada's trade. Don't have much of an impact in the short term, but quite important. And then in terms of of policy, things that I don't want to say that we're doing anything wrong because policy is not always just about the economy. It's seeking to achieve other objectives as well. But changes in the tax structure in Canada. So we're gradually right now increasing the tax that we effectively levy on investment by slowing down the pace at which companies can write off their capital investments. Hmm. And it's a whole separate conversation and a technical one around why that matters, but I view that as something at the margin that we should maybe rethink. And and that's just one example. Now, on on greenhouse gas emissions, so I I pointed out that that creating a a challenge for emissions-intensive sectors, I think, you know, that's fine. We are incurring an economic cost to achieve an objective. And, And of course, there's a productive conversation around how to do policy design and, and and so on. But it's the uncertainty that I think is a big drag on investment overall, not just in oil and gas. And that uncertainty is not just because of the government. I mean, think about the large emitter carbon tax system that we have in Canada. There is legitimate uncertainty around whether it will exist after the next federal election, or if it mm-hmm. does exist, what will be the price path? And so I think Opposition parties, too, can either amplify or mitigate policy uncertainty by you know, either committing to, to keep a certain policy uh, or clarify what their positions are. And so I think some of that uncertainty is, is tied to this political dynamic between multiple parties. So there may be uh, concrete policy things we either can do now or make choices about, or uh, to your point, that the opposition could uh, instill confidence perhaps by uh, clarifying their intentions now that it certainly looks uh, like they'll form the next government. But in a philosophical sense, uh, without getting too out there, you know, we cover the news every day, the world is unlikely to suddenly become less chaotic and more certain, I think, um, in the coming years with the effects of climate change uh, and global political instability that we're already seeing. Indeed. Can you even uh, future-proof your economy in that manner? Do you know what I'm asking you? Yeah, certainly. And I, and I would agree with you that the world may increasingly become uncertain. You know, I, I hope that we are both wrong. Uh, But there are still long-term challenges that we know are ahead, such as an aging population, both here and in many other countries. And that's going to be a a challenge economically. It'll challenge for healthcare systems and and so on and so forth. So so there are known long-term challenges that we face that we might not be paying as much attention to as we should, or using as a motivation to improve policy where we can. So again, internal trade is is one where Canada stands out as having a particular problem relative to other countries. And this requires provincial premiers more than anything else really start to seriously think about making it easier to do business across provincial borders. And we are starting to see some really interesting moves there. So so I mean, this is kind of hopeful for the future. We saw that premiers and the federal government agreed to start on a kind of mutual recognition agreement in trucking. Mm-hmm. You know? and, and again, that sounds really narrow and and niche, but it could be quite important where a province just says, well, if, if the truck abides by the regulation of our neighboring province in terms of axle weight or signage or uh, whatever other regulation you have in mind, then it's automatically good to go in our province. And, and that could be a big improvement in our ability to transport goods, which 
lowers costs and increases productivity, lowers prices, right. uh, boosts growth. And so that's a really, uh, a really important move. Or Ontario recently, uh, in 2023, last year, uh, exempting certain types of health professions from having their credentials be done through Ontario. Basically saying, if you're licensed in Manitoba, uh, then you're welcome to move to Ontario and you're automatically good to go. That's That's another example of what provinces could do across the board. Uh, So we might, and I hope that we do see those moves because in the face of an uncertain world, getting our own domestic policy right becomes uh, very important. And I also think it requires that we constantly have in mind growth, productivity, investment policy, then we continually revise it and return to it and try and improve upon it. And what some countries have done in Europe in particular is they've set up what they're calling kind of productivity councils. So Ireland, for example, has what they call a national competitiveness and productivity council. And and it's there to regularly provide accessible analysis and recommendations to keep a a critical uh, spotlight on these issues. And so that might be something for Canada to consider as well, just baking in incremental improvement. If we continue to see this decline, whether because of our own policies or because of uh, global uncertainty, what's the ultimate result of a long-term decline in productivity? Will there come a tipping point and what will that look like, uh, practically speaking? Well, at the end of the day, low productivity growth means low growth in our living standards. You know, labor compensation per hour and the purchasing power of that tracks almost perfectly over the long-term productivity growth. So if you have slow growth in one, that's going to lead to slow growth in our overall living standards. And, and we'll feel that in terms of what we call cost of living and affordability, but it's really just about our incomes and the purchasing power of them not increasing by the amount that we'd like to see. And so at the the end of the day, it's productivity that drives earnings growth in the future. If we can turn this around um, and make some critical investments and remove some of those barriers that you talked about, how quickly would we see that reflected in uh, not only our productivity numbers, but the result of those productivity numbers? And I guess what I'm asking with as we grapple with this problem is if this is similar to climate change in which, you know, we've already baked in uh, a few years of pain, even if we begin to do all the right things now? It's a good question. Now, governments like to, uh, of course, claim credit for good economic developments and opposition parties are quick to blame governments for uh, for poor economic performance. And, and usually neither of those is true. Governments can nudge things at the margin. And if we were to have a magic wand and fix every policy we could on productivity and investment, eliminate internal trade immediately tomorrow, it's not as though Canada's economy would immediately jump up to a new higher level. It takes time to converge to higher long-term levels of potential output, in part because you have to invest and build in the capital that's going to come with uh, that boosted efficiency and productivity. And so we are talking about even getting policy really perfect, just purely on the economics, uh, nudging growth rates by tenths of a percentage point, hmm. which you know might sound disappointing. And so, like, oh, well, what's the point? Well, those tenths of a percentage point, when you compound them over many years, translates into big improvements. So the magic of compound interest uh, applies to economic growth as well. And so nudging growth rates up 0.2, 0.3% means that over a decade or two, uh, those benefits really do accumulate pretty dramatically. So last question then, uh, since, and again, I don't want to assume anything in particular, but since it appears we may have a new prime minister soon, if you had an opportunity to whisper in that person's ear about, you know, what we're facing and how to tackle it, what would, what would you say? Well, I recognize that uh, leaders of provinces or or Canada face lots of competing pressures and trade-offs. And that's really what policy is all about. So we're, we're talking about productivity, investment, and growth. And I, I do think that is a very important foundational uh, 
uh, issue for us to prioritize. It's not everything. And sometimes we might want to adopt a policy that is a drag on economic growth. So climate policy, for example, we're achieving a benefit and incurring a cost to do that. Yes. Mm-hmm. Or, or think about maybe some tax increases to fund the inevitable expansion in healthcare systems because of an aging population. You know, we would enact those policies not to boost growth, but to achieve objectives. And so if I were to give advice to a leader of any government, be open and transparent about the trade-offs. Make it clear what a policy is going to do for productivity and growth. Put a productivity lens on every budget measure. For example, we do the uh, gender-based analysis federally now for many years, and I think that's quite productive. It increases transparency in our understanding of policy choices and trade-offs, and we could do that with productivity as well. And so it doesn't mean prioritizing economic outcomes ahead of all others, uh, but it does mean being very explicit and deliberate uh, about the policy choices that we do make. And that would facilitate a debate among Canadians um, and create a more informed electorate. Trevor, thank you so much for this. I've heard uh, so much about our decline in productivity, and I finally feel like I understand a little bit about what's under the hood here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Trevor Toome from the University of Calgary's Department of Economics. That was The Big Story. For more from us, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can always... Shoot us some feedback by writing to hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or by calling us at 416-935-5935. I would love to hear from some of you who have thoughts about us not covering whatever the heck happened in America last night, if there even is a winner by today. We figured your entire feed would be full of that and some of you would be sick of it and we would be here with a story that matters to Canadians, as we always are. The Big Story is available in every single podcast player and on your smart speaker. Just ask it to play The Big Story podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.